Hi, I'm Karen Donaldson, a registered dietitian, personal trainer, and an EFT certified weight loss coach. And I have a question for you. Why is it so hard to lose weight? Why is it that we're spending billions of dollars each year on diets, diet-related products and services, and books, and gadgets, and gym memberships, and exercise gizmos? Why are we trying new diets several times a year and having what should be all of the information we need to lose the weight and keep it off, and yet we can't? Over two-thirds of us are overweight or obese, and the problem isn't getting any better. And that's just taking into account the physical part of being overweight. The emotional toll that is taking is huge. So many people are accomplished in so many other areas of their lives. They're smart, educated, they hold down decent jobs, they raise families, they make a contribution to society. And yet, even with the volumes of knowledge surrounding them about weight loss, I still get the same question several times per day. Karen, I know what I'm supposed to do to lose weight, so why can't I do it? And my clients are smart. They could write a book on what they're supposed to eat and what they're not supposed to eat, or how much or what type of exercise is best for them, but yet they can't seem to make it happen. And it's heartbreaking. I can't tell you the number of times I've had clients break down and cry in my office. They feel guilty and stupid and ashamed and embarrassed and really hopeless. And their healthcare providers aren't helping either. They've been told by the doctors that they're gonna die if they don't lose weight or they've been called lazy or fat, or that if they just had more willpower, they could make this happen. But it doesn't. People are either not able to lose the weight in the first place, or if they do, they aren't able to keep it off. So what is it that is stopping people from being able to control what foods are going into their bodies? What is keeping them from knowing the answer to that question I know what I'm supposed to do, so why can't I do it? Well, I am so excited to answer these questions for you, and I have a lot to say about this subject. Some of the answers might be very different from what you'd expect. You already know what you're supposed to do, and now I'm going to share with you why you can't, and then we'll talk about how you can. The first thing I'm going to talk about is carbohydrates and sugars and the way they affect our bodies and our brains and our, our willpower and our ability to lose weight and to keep it off. I'm going to show you the effect that these carbs have on our blood sugar and on our insulin levels and how they can so easily get stored as fat, but I also want to talk to you about the way they make you feel. There is a very real reason why foods like bread, cereal, rice, pasta, cookies, crackers, cakes, donuts, chips, bagels, tortillas, waffles, pancakes, french fries, soda, sports drinks, potatoes, chocolate, ice cream, and so on are called comfort foods. And if you have ever self-medicated with these carbohydrates to make yourself feel better or to calm down, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. So let me introduce you to your body. I love to use this board to teach people about what's really going on with their bodies and with their minds in a way that is very easy to understand. First off, here is your liver and your pancreas. They play a very important role when it comes to fat storage and also our cholesterol levels. The pancreas secretes a hormone called insulin, which I show as these little green keys, and their job is to unlock the door to our cells, like your muscle cells, so that sugars can get inside and provide you with energy. When your blood sugars are high, you make a lot of insulin. The liver is also very important because it helps you out when your blood sugars get too low, but it's also responsible for making your cholesterol. And as you'll soon see, high cholesterol levels can happen as a result of too many sugars in your diet. Down here, we have a muscle cell. If you take several of these cells and put them together, you have a muscle tissue, like in your biceps and your arms, or in your quadriceps in your legs. And inside of your muscle cells are these cute little guys. These are your glucose or sugar receivers. 
It's their job to hear insulin knock on the door and open up these cells so that the sugars can get inside. But sometimes, actually oftentimes, this system doesn't work like it's supposed to. Over here, we have belly fat, also called central obesity. This is where all of those extra sugars get stored when we eat or drink too many of them. And these little blue circles, these represent carbohydrates or sugars. Every carbohydrate that we eat or drink is made up of these sugars, even the ones that don't taste sweet. We have simple sugars, like those that are found in candy and soda, and then we also have complex sugars or complex carbohydrates, and these are the ones that are found in bread and cereal and rice and pasta and cookies and crackers and potatoes. All the things that aren't sweet, but they still contain sugars. They are just simply many sugar molecules hooked together. Again, they don't taste sweet, but they still are sugars. And when it comes to raising our blood sugars, both types of these carbohydrates, the simple ones and the complex ones, are responsible. It doesn't matter if you are drinking a soda or if you're eating a big bowl of pasta, both types of sugars are going to raise your blood sugar levels. So here's what happens. Whenever you eat or drink those foods, the bread, cereal, rice, pasta, that whole list that I just talked about a moment ago, or you drink beverages that have sugar or carbohydrates in them, like soda or juices, Gatorades, Powerades, and so on, all of those foods end up in your stomach and become digested. And then from there, the sugars that they turn into are actually sent out to the blood and they are now called blood sugar or blood glucose. So these are all of the blood sugars or blood glucoses that are now floating around as a result of you eating or drinking those foods that are higher in carbohydrates. And this is actually what is supposed to happen. When we eat or drink these foods, they are supposed to get digested, they're digested in your stomach, they transfer to your small intestines, and then from there, they're released out into the blood and they raise your blood sugar levels sending sugar to all of the different parts of your body that need it. So for all of your muscle cells and every other cell in your body that needs some energy, this is the process that is supposed to happen. What happens more specifically is that the blood sugar levels go up and that sends a signal to your pancreas to make some of those insulin keys. And your pancreas says, okay, I can make some of those insulin keys. And it makes the keys, they travel down through the blood, until they get to your muscle cells. And when they get there, they knock on the door. Here's where you get to use your imagination. So we have these insulin keys knocking on the door of our muscle cells, and they're supposed to be waking up these little glucose or sugar receivers that live inside of your muscle cells. The receivers are supposed to hear the knock, they're supposed to answer the door, unlock it, and allow the sugars to get inside to provide energy for those muscle cells. And this is how it's supposed to work. This is great. The muscle cells are happy because they got the energy that they need, and the blood is happy because now the blood sugars are a little bit more back to normal, and all is well with the world. And that's how it's supposed to work. But unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way. What happens for so many people is that throughout the years or even on a daily basis now, they are consuming too many carbohydrates, those comfort foods that we were talking about. So for a person like that, their blood sugar levels are high and they maybe have been doing this for several years or this happens on a daily basis with their meals. But what happens with their insulin is that the sugars still send a signal to the pancreas to make insulin. The insulin gets made, it travels down through the blood until it gets to the muscle cells. It knocks on the door of the muscle cells just like before, but instead of these guys, the little glucose receivers answering the door, it's like they can't even hear the knock. The insulin keys are knocking, knock, knock, knock. These glucose or sugar receivers though are not hearing the knock. 
it's like they're sleeping or they have their headphones on or they're just ignoring you. And what's really happening is that the cells of our body, our muscle cells for example, have started to become resistant to the insulin. And thus we get the word insulin resistance. It literally means that when these insulin keys are knocking on the door, the glucose or the sugar receivers inside of the cells are resistant. They're not listening. Which unfortunately means that these sugars are not able to get into the muscle cells where they belong, which is bad. You don't have the energy that you need and also your blood sugar levels are way too high. Fortunately, our bodies try to help us out and what happens next is that your pancreas says, oh shoot, this is a problem. I really need to do something to help this person out and your pancreas goes into overdrive and it starts making a whole bunch of extra insulin. It really ramps up the production of insulin. And what happens then is you get all of these extra insulin keys just beating down the door saying, wake up, come on receivers, we need you to answer the door, we need you to let those sugars get in. And finally, if you can get enough of these insulin keys made, these guys will start to hear. It's like the receivers are saying, fine, whatever, shut up now, we're coming, we'll answer the door, we really don't want to, but you've kind of overpowered the system, so I guess we'll open the door and we'll let some of those sugars get in. Which is sort of nice. At least you got some of those sugars into the muscle cells where they belong, but now some problems begin. First of all, there is only so much sugar that can be stored in these muscle cells, and you still have a lot of extra sugars floating in, around in your blood, and we need to do something with those. Second of all, it took a lot of extra insulin to make this happen. And that's very tiring on your pancreas. Over time, you're really putting a lot of wear and tear on your pancreas, kind of burning out your pancreas. And actually, all of this extra insulin that you produced, unfortunately, is a risk factor for heart disease. It can cause increases in blood pressure, increasing your risk for heart disease and other artery diseases. But also what happens is these insulin keys now they look around and they're like, oh dear, we still have too many sugars hanging around in the blood. We need to do something with those. And so they try to take care of them in the best way they know how. One thing that happens is that some of these extra sugars end up being stored in the liver. And the liver is supposed to store some of these sugars for us, but not too many sugars. And when we get excessive sugar stored in the liver, for example, three extra sugars, those combine with three extra fats and they make a triglyceride, which is a type of cholesterol. And then those triglycerides leak out into your blood and they raise your cholesterol levels. So indirectly, by eating too many of these carbohydrate foods, you're also adversely affecting your cholesterol levels. So you store a few in the muscle cells, they get full, you store some extra ones in the liver and you make triglycerides and mess up your cholesterol levels. And unfortunately, you still have some left and they have to go somewhere. So here's what happens. Boom, boom, boom. These extra sugars end up getting stored as fat right in the belly. They have to go somewhere. And this is the most likely place that they're gonna end up and this is really the basics of how we end up storing extra fat in our belly as a result of these extra carbohydrates. So of course we don't want that to happen. We've just stored extra fat in the belly and we've made some cholesterol not in our favor. But another thing happens too, and that is over time, you really start to tire out your pancreas. So let's say this has been going on for several years and you've had insulin resistance and you're storing extra belly fat and you're raising your triglyceride levels and your blood pressure is going up. What else is happening at the same time is that your pancreas is getting tired. So the next time you have all of these sugars floating around in your blood and you ask your pancreas for help in making insulin, here's what happens. You make some insulin keys they come knocking on the door. Again, the glucose receivers, the sugar receivers aren't hearing them very well because you still have some insulin resistance, but now 
your pancreas is tired and it simply can't keep producing that much insulin. So as a result, these blood sugars end up staying high. They don't ever make it into the muscle cells or into the liver. They stay high in your blood and then you have type 2 diabetes. So it's really just a continuous cycle of high blood sugar levels, insulin spikes, making too much insulin, affecting your risk for heart disease, increasing your cholesterol levels, storing extra fat, and also increasing your risk of diabetes. And that's just the physical part. We still have to talk about the emotional part. Again, this is only part of the problem. In the second video in the series, I'm going to show you what these carbs are doing to your brain and just how effective they are at comforting us and making us feel all better and why we eat them even though we know better. Make sure you stay tuned for that video because it will really clear up why we aren't able to do what we're supposed to do to lose the weight and to keep it off. So I want you to take a moment right now and think about how this story applies to you. Have you ever eaten those processed and refined carbohydrates even when you weren't hungry? Even though when logically you knew better? I'm sure you will agree with me that most of the time physical hunger has absolutely nothing to do with this. In fact, if I'm honest, I can recall several times throughout my life where I was eating when I absolutely was not hungry. There was no way I needed a big bowl of buttered popcorn an hour after dinner or half a bag of chips after breakfast. And I certainly didn't need to stand at the kitchen counter and mindlessly inhale handfuls of cold cereal. And I knew better. I had the knowledge, but I was just like you. I couldn't stop. It didn't matter how much I knew, it didn't help. And it was really embarrassing and as a dietitian and a personal trainer and the owner of a weight loss clinic, I should have been able to lose weight, but I couldn't. And it was really starting to affect my business and my life. But more importantly, it was so frustrating. How could I help other people if I couldn't even help myself? And it was really heartbreaking too. I would hear the stories of my clients and I would feel their pain and I would teach them everything I knew about diet and exercise, but the end result was always the same. They might lose some weight, but then they'd gain it back. Or maybe they'd lose five pounds and then they would stop. Certainly not dramatic or impressive results, but I wasn't getting results either. The truth is that I was using food the same way that my clients were, and I didn't know how to stop. And I was frustrated and embarrassed and ashamed and angry. And I was thinking about this all the time. It was like I was obsessed. It really became quite ridiculous. It was running my life. I would do what my clients did. I would keep a journal, record my food, set a goal weight, and I would be so excited and so focused. And then a few days later, or maybe a week or two later, I would still be overweight, or maybe I would have gained some weight. And I could never figure out why with all the energy and all the focus I put into other areas of my life, it didn't work when it came to food. So there I was, stuck and overweight and trying to figure out what to do for my clients and also for myself, and something truly amazing happened. I started to notice emails in my inbox about the effect that our thoughts and our emotions have on our physical health, even on our weight. And I found this really interesting but it wasn't until I started to study and understand the very powerful connection between food and our emotions and our brain chemistry that it really started to make sense. It wasn't about willpower at all. There was so much more to the story. No wonder my clients and I were failing. We didn't understand what the effect of all of these sugars and carbs and comfort foods were having on our minds. We knew they were making us fat, but we didn't really know why. So I spent the next several years researching this and studying this, and there was so much to learn. It was so fascinating. There's so much psychology and emotion surrounding our eating issues, and it's vital that we understand this and that we learn how to work with this so that it doesn't work against us. So I started to practice what I was learning on myself, and it worked. 
at the age of 49, right at the time when it seems nearly impossible for women to lose weight because of all the changes in the hormones and so on, I lost over 25 pounds. And I'm so happy to share that I've kept that weight off for over four years. It's not coming back. I don't even think about it coming back. And I knew then that I had to share this with as many people as possible. I knew without a doubt at the very level of my soul that sharing this information was one of the reasons that I'm on this planet. And so here I am sharing this with you right now. Of course, I want to help people and to share the information to help them release the physical weight, but I also want to help people heal from all of the pain that comes with not being able to lose the weight and keep it off. The shame, the guilt, the frustration, the feelings of being a failure or not being good enough, the feelings of hating their bodies, and basically not liking or loving themselves. I also wanted to help people learn to live their lives, to like show up in their bodies and not put off living, to participate, to be happy, to be joyful and connected, to have a peaceful relationship with food and also with themselves. And I can't tell you how blessed I am to really be able to understand this complex relationship between our bodies and our minds and how much it has to do with food and to be able to share it with you. I have a master's degree in microbiology and biochemistry as well as a degree in nutrition. And it's that scientific background that gave me the ability to truly understand how all of this works. That combined with a deep understanding of just how powerful our emotions and our cravings are when it comes to our weight, really gives me the background to be able to convey this information to you in a way that's easy to understand so that you can apply it to yourself and start your own weight loss transformation and your healing journey. I really have a passion for helping people lose weight, but even more importantly, in helping them keep it off forever. Knowing how your body works is really important, but unless you know how your emotions work and how they create your cravings, you are going to have a hard time sticking to whatever program you're on. This video is one of a three-part video series in which I'm going to share with you exactly what to do to cure emotional eating. In the second video, I'm going to talk about the biochemicals in your brain that are triggered by eating neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine that drive your brain. All of the willpower in the world is not going to stop your cravings if your brain is being triggered by food. Understanding this process is really key to changing it. This is the information that has allowed my, many of my clients, really all of my clients, to get off of the merry-go-round of yo-yo dieting and weight for good. One perfect example is Kathy. When Kathy first came to see me, she was a mess, as according to her, physically and emotionally. Her cravings were out of control, she was stressed to the max, and she was well on her way to type 2 diabetes. She had very severe insulin resistance, which means that her blood sugars were creeping up, and so was her blood pressure. Her triglyceride levels were way too high, so physically and emotionally, she was a wreck. She was doing exactly what I was talking about a few minutes ago with this picture board. She was eating carbohydrate rich comfort foods like bread and pasta and crackers and cookies and candy and chocolate and so on. And her blood sugar levels were rising continuously. This was happening to her every day and she was making extra insulin to try to get those excess sugars into her muscle cells, but there were too many. So most of them were ending up in her liver, jacking up her cholesterol levels, and the rest were being stored as her fat right in her belly, just like the picture board. And here's the kicker. She knew, probably like you know, what she was supposed to be doing, but she just couldn't make it happen. And she felt like a total failure. And she was embarrassed and she was ashamed, but that didn't matter. She just couldn't make it happen. And she was smart. She's a capable woman, she had a job, she raised a beautiful family, but the one thing she couldn't get control of was her food and therefore her weight. And I'm so grateful that I got to work with her because now she has lost over 45 pounds, her blood pressure is normal, 
and her sugars and her triglycerides have returned to a healthy level. She's no longer one step away from diabetes and she feels great. And she's handling stress better and she has more peace in her life overall. It's such a thrill to be able to help people achieve that. Some days I can't even believe how lucky I am. And I would love to make this happen for you. Wouldn't you love to make Kathy's story your story and to live in the body that you desire for the rest of your life? A healthy and a lean body and the mindset that is able to help you choose foods that serve you for your highest and best good. In the next video, I'm going to train you to spot the way that your brain is hijacked by some really powerful neurotransmitters that make it nearly impossible to lose weight and an action plan for counteracting their effects. I'd love to talk to you personally about the information that I've shared in this video. Please write your comments in the box below and we can continue the dialogue. And click below and like the page. Most importantly, I'd like you to make a comment so that I can find out more about you and your life and what matters to you. Thank you so very much for caring enough about your health to watch this video. And I look forward to sharing more tips as we continue with this video training.